You're listening to Voces Críticas, Critical Voices. I am your producer and host, Silvana Falcón. On July 25, 2019, I had an opportunity to speak with Juan Carlos Davila, who was in San Juan, Puerto Rico. For nearly two weeks, the people of Puerto Rico were united in their demands, calling for the resignation of Puerto Rican Governor Ricardo Rosello. I spoke with Juan shortly after Governor Rosello officially resigned. Juan is a documentary filmmaker, journalist, and PhD student in Latin American and Latinx studies at UC Santa Cruz. His work focuses on environmentalism, social movements, and globalization. Davila currently works as a correspondent for Democracy Now!, which featured him several times reporting about the protests from San Juan. His journalist work has also been featured in Telesur, The Huffington Post, The Washington Post, and The Independent. Here is Juan Carlos Davila on the phone with us from San Juan, Puerto Rico. Juan Carlos, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. We are on the air with Juan Carlos Davila. He's calling in from Puerto Rico. Tell us what's the latest happening there. First of all, thanks for having me here, Silvana. So what is happening here in Puerto Rico, things are finally more calm today than they have been in the past almost two weeks now. So yesterday what happened is that the governor of Puerto Rico resigned from his position. What he did is that he posted a Facebook message around 11.30 p.m. yesterday announcing that he was leaving his seat. He's going to remain in office until the end of the month and formally be out of office in August 2nd. And this comes after almost two weeks of protests here in Puerto Rico and protests that have intensified throughout the days and people being out in the streets feeling very indignated with a document containing uh, a chat, a telegram chat, where it showed uh, messages between the governor and his executive team. And in this chat, people will see how the governor will make insults of Puerto Ricans at large, really. I mean, he was insulting uh, politicians in the diaspora. He was insulting politicians within his own party, politicians in Puerto Rico. He was also making fun of artists, making fun of people, making jokes about the deaths in Hurricane Maria, making homophobic and misogynist comments. So there were a set of uh, almost 900 pages that were leaked uh, containing all these conversations that he had with the executive team. People felt really so disrespected by this document of, of the conversations that were happening in this chat that they took to the streets and people were committed to do not stop protesting until the governor actually resigned. And people were not even asking for impeachment. He, they were asking for uh, him to resign and that they were going to keep in the streets and they were going to keep paralyzing the country and the economy until, or at least, you know, business as usual until this happened. So what happened yesterday was a culmination of those protests. Uh, the governor presented, like I said before, his resignation or at least officially announced his resignation and said that he would remain in office until next week. And now what's happening in Puerto Rico, things are more calm right now with the whole situation. There was today a big march in the financial district of Puerto Rico today, and actually it was going to be a protest, but it turned to be more, in a way, like a celebration and saying that people are going to keep active and being militant in the streets regardless, because Ricardo Rosselló's resignation is not the only thing that Puerto Ricans are demanding. So let's talk a little bit about that, because I think the media tends to make it sound like it's one demand accomplished, moving on. But, you know, we had the allegations of fraud, the chats come out. There are multiple demands that the Puerto Rican people are making. So what are some of the other demands beyond the resignation? So really, there's no like formal demands other than, for example, a feminist group here in Puerto Rico called the Feminist Collective Under Construction. They have been putting out some demands. I think they have been the ones up front of that, saying that they, they want that a state of emergency uh, be declared in Puerto Rico. They are also are, are demanding uh, the audit of the debt. And, and the audit of the debt is because Puerto Rico has a large debt. It's a large public debt of $74 billion. But if you count pension obligations and other factors, uh, some people are estimating that the public debt 
is over 100 billion, you know? And Puerto Rico being a, uh, the small island that it is, I mean, w when you put this money in comparison or, or this debt in comparison, we can compare Puerto Rico to the uh, financial crisis in Greece and the financial crisis in Detroit. So people are demanding an audit of the debt that actually shows uh, how this money was spent, that this is not a debt that has been made up. Because with all the corruption in the government and the legacy of colonialism in Puerto Rico, people want to make sure that that, that money that apparently they owe to bondholders and to creditors is actually real, that it's not made up. And it's not, for example, projects that have been charged more. And I'm putting emphasis on this because it's important to, to put the context. The debt of Puerto Rico, you know, many of this public debt, when a country gets indebted or gets loans is for, you know, to make a better roads, is to maybe build a hospital, build a stadium, something that would actually benefit the whole citizens. That's why it's a public debt. But then that's questionable if that debt and that and those loans that the government took were actually used for the benefit of the people. So that's why the debt has been questionable. And if you come to Puerto Rico and you see the infrastructure, if you see the roads, definitely it's not a debt where we have a great infrastructure here. Just, you know, as after Hurricane Maria, we have a lot of issues with the electricity, and that's part of it. So some of the things that have been mentioned, you know, as the demands are the audit of the debt that the government declares a state of emergency. And, and what I'm saying is there's no formal claims yet or formal demands because this is not a, a really uh, organized a movement, what has been happening here, which is what is interesting in Puerto Rico, is really spontaneous. Is people are really organizing among themselves with not necessarily a political organization or a social movement organization. What we have seen here in Puerto Rico is that people from the barrios, people from the communities, people from different cities are all organizing autonomously but with the same claim of wanting Ricardo Rosselló out of office. So that's why I cannot, we cannot say that there's like a, one formal demand that everybody has, because it has not been put together throughout maybe an organized collective, which, for example, is what happened in, in Vieques. Puerto Rico had a, a lot of protests in, from 1999 to 2003, take the a U.S. military base out of the island of Vieques, but this was more organized. There, there was, even though there was like different collectives, there was a coalition and people agreed on certain things and people had meetings. But here this has not happened. So this has been in a way spontaneous, which is also what makes it powerful that this has really become spontaneous. And talking also about the demands, this is something related, is that, you know, people are in the streets, but it's not only because of Ricardo Rosselló, it's, even though this is not contextualized as a formal demand, but it's because people have a lot of insatisfactions and that go from the austerity measures that have been implemented from all this issue of the debt, because the debt has been used to justify austerity measures in Puerto Rico, and this includes the closing of public schools, this includes tuition hikes, reduction in pensions, reduction in health care services. On top of that, you also add the lack of response after Hurricane Maria. And, and this is the governor that was actually administering the country when Hurricane Maria made landfall in Puerto Rico. So there's a lot of insatisfaction of people with the austerity measures and the lack of proper response after Hurricane Maria that really, when these chats were released, it was the catalyst moment of all of this. It, it was finally what got people moving. I think that's what's so amazing is the grassroots nature of the movement, the incredible sort of coalitions, the youth feminists, the other kinds of actors that have come out, the spontaneity of it. I think I had shared with you this article by Fernando Tormoso Ponte from the University of Maryland in Baltimore County. And he was talking about the context for the uprising and that it was so much more than the resignation of the governor. And he talked also about the auditing of the debt and the canceling of the debt, like you're talking about the education, the needing greater media transparency. He posted this in a blog in the Washington Post. I'd encourage folks to read it. Other kinds of demands were gender-based violence, uh, respond to this crisis, the removal of FOM, the Financial Oversight and Management Board for Puerto Rico. That was an Obama-era board that came to be. 
And so the demands are quite varied. And so are you feeling somewhat hopeful that the demands and the movements that have emerged that you've seen there on the ground, has it been inspiring or hopeful to you to see so many different people come together? I think it's it's really inspiring to see how seeing how people who were not politically involved here in Puerto Rico have been out in the streets. You see, for example, the motorcycle clubs, people who have never been involved politically, you know, going to a protest, you know, uh, really uh, uh, calling for social justice. You also see people from uh, what we call here the, here the fiebre, which is also the people who are uh, club cars, you know. And this is not like uh, an elite group of cars. I mean, these are people of the streets, you know, that the people from lower classes, from popular classes, from working class backgrounds that have all these hobbies of cars and car racing and street racing that have also been involved. Then you also have all the youth that has been attracted with the whole reggaeton culture and, and the urban music culture here in Puerto Rico that are a generation that, that probably, you know, has been raised seeing all this struggle and see all this, like, new movement emerge. For example, is this generation that have grown up seeing the movement against the paying the debt and, or auditing the debt, uh, it's a generation that has been growing, seeing the student movement at the University of Puerto Rico. And it seems that that seed was planted and they are finally, or they are now responding because they get older. Because you see that many, in many of these protests, many people that were 18, 20 year old were there, very committed to it, you know? So, so it's very, it's really very inspiring to see the cross generational and, and also how this movement also transcends class boundaries. Because you would see people from lower class neighborhoods in Puerto Rico protesting together with people from all San Juan, which if you ex- exclude La Perla and Puerta de Tierra, are usually a middle and even high middle uh, class backgrounds. So you would see all these people together. And it's also inspiring seeing the business people in, lo- in all San Juan and uh, the people who own businesses and the merchants. And, and I'm talking about the ones that are Puerto Rican specifically and the residents living there also being supportive of this protest. So th- there's that part of how these have actually united. And, and I don't want to sound like a cliche, but really what has happened here is a unity of the Puerto Rican people all together in one demand, which I think the only thing that has compared in recent history was the case of Vieques, like I mentioned before, which was a whole country asking the U.S. Navy to withdraw from the terrains of, of, of Vieques. I think that we got to be careful looking at it, and it's a part of what comes after Ricardo Rosselló. And, for example, the Fiscal Control Board that we have mentioned in this interview, the Fiscal Control Board actually could use all this corruption scandal, all this misbehavior from the government to actually advocate for more power for itself. And we got to be very careful with that. We don't want the insatisfaction of the people with the current administration to turn into more power for a federally appointed board that its members are unelected officials that respond to Wall Street bondholders and uh, and U.S. corporate interests. So that's a ch- the challenge of this. And then there's the other challenges of, uh, of who comes after Ricardo Rosselló in, in, in regards of uh, as a governor, Wanda Vasquez. Yes, tell me about yeah. Wanda Vasquez. Tell me about her. So, so Wanda Vasquez is the current Secretary of Justice in Puerto Rico. If the governor resigns in Puerto Rico, the person who, who would be governor is a Secretary of State. But the Secretary of State was also in the chat, so he resigned after the scandal came up. So according to the Constitution of Puerto Rico, the next person in line are the secretaries of the agencies here. So the first one, according to the Constitution, is the one of the Secretary of Justice would be the one to hold the governor position. But two things are important here. You know, the Secretary of Justice is not a person that was elected by the people. So it's, it's someone that was appointed by the governor. So we, we're going to be having someone that is be sitting in the governor's chair without being elected by the people, which can become problematic. And then there's the other fact that this person actually is also involved in ethical misbehavior. She also has her chat scandal, not as, as bad as Ricardo Rosselló has it, but she also has some chat messages that have been released or, or that some journalists are here locally are putting out there 
that also question her ethics. And then Wanda Vasquez is also a person that when she was Procuradora de la Mujer, which is an agency here that looks after the rights of women and the well-being of women, she was actually very anti the feminist movement in Puerto Rico. According to the information I have, there was a statistic that, that that agency had of violence against women, of domestic violence, of uh, accounting and, and documenting all the domestic violence against women. And she actually got rid of that program that would uh, follow that statistic. And when the feminist movements here in Puerto Rico have actually protested that she has actually been an antagonist of the feminist movement in Puerto Rico. And not to talk that she has very conservative ideals, more conservative than Ricardo Rosselló. She's, I mean, as far as her politics, she is more conservative than Ricardo Rosselló, or at least, you know, what has been stated publicly. Because we can see now that Ricardo Rosselló, you know, try to play the democratic liberal here in Puerto Rico, but actually when you see the chat, he was as conservative as, you know, as, I don't want to say, yeah. as a Republican <laughs> in the U.S., you know? Yeah, he's I don't want to say Trump because that would be going too much, but yeah. he, but you can see with his chat, his form of acting, he's a conservative Republican calling himself a liberal Democrat. And I think that's as to why people are so mad about him is the hypocrisy that he in what he believed to be his private conversation, he didn't act the way he was trying to behave in public. So that said, you know, we've got to be careful with, with Wanda Vasquez because she publicly, I mean, has been documented that she's, at least publicly, she's more conservative than Ricardo Rosselló. It's going to be a challenge to see how are we going to move ahead if she, on August 2nd, becomes the new governor of Puerto Rico. Because right now there's no signs that she's not going to resign, like Luis Rivera did, right? There hasn't been any movement on her part to also, because she's implicated in the chats. Yeah, well, she was not involved in this chat, the Telegram chat. It was a WhatsApp chat in, I believe, 2018 about some investigation that, that was happening, and she actually was trying to cover it up. Some investigation, and she has, oh, and, and she also has a reputation of covering up people with power. But she wasn't involved in that chat. I, I want to be clear with that. It's just that there's like a WhatsApp scandal that was before of this that it shows evidence of her trying to cover up certain investigation of of people with power. And she has a pattern of doing this. So she, is, as the Secretary of Justice, she has not really has the best record of actually advocating for justice for the Puerto Rican people, but actually using her position to cover up people in power. Wanted to talk about the role of artists. We had sort of talked a little bit about this over email. Can you talk specifically about the role artists played here in sort of keeping the energy going? You know, it was 12, 13 days of street protests. If you could talk a little bit about the importance of artists getting involved. Yeah, so far we left that to the end because it has been very interesting watching so many artists that are renowned internationally and are good artists and have so much influence and actually have so much successful careers that they were willing to put their careers on the line to have a firm position about this issue. You know, Ricky Martin, Reciente Calle 13, Bad Bunny, Tommy Torres, Oscar winner Benicio del Toro, all of them really didn't hesitate to take a firm stance of what they understood was right. And I think, obviously, the reach that they have is a reach that social movement organizations don't have. It's a reach that leftists, left-wing political parties don't have. So really, they use that power that they have to reach people and to get people's attention to actually push for justice and push for a just cause. Risking, you know, the careers because it's not easy when artists that are so popular and so famous and so successful take on strong political stances. That that can become very risky for their careers. Doing that, I, I just imagine what could happen, for example, in the U.S. is, for example, if figures like at the level of Beyonce, that level of reach of the people would actually not only just make a comment, but actually be committed to be in the streets. And Ricky Martin was committed to be in the streets. Oh, yeah, he uh, was in the streets. Yeah, he, yeah. He Bad Bunny, they were committed to be there. They didn't tear gas when they were there, but I can see that they were ready even to be tear gas. Thank you so much for giving us the update there from Puerto Rico. Yeah, thank you for having me.
That was Juan Carlos Davila giving us the latest news out of San Juan, Puerto Rico, shortly after the official resignation of Governor Ricardo Rosello. Thanks to Juan for taking the time to come on to Voces Criticas to share this information and his analysis with us.